welcome to season five of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. This podcast was born out of the 2020 global pandemic. Season one was launched to help people through the pandemic. Season two focused more on work-related issues such as HR, marketing and leadership. Season three and four centred on startup founders and tech leaders, revealing the secrets to their success. The focus of season five is about how technology can have a positive impact on people and planet. My name is Nicholas Steele, founder of JJP Talent Solutions, an Australian IT recruitment company. I've had the privilege of talking to numerous tech leaders over the last 20 plus years and love sharing their stories and insights. I hope you enjoy listening. I'm delighted to introduce Dinesh Palapana. Dinesh is a doctor, a lawyer, a disability advocate, and the first quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland. He's also a researcher, a researcher in spinal cord injury, a doctor for the Gold Coast Titans physical disability rugby team, and is a senior advisor to the Disability Royal Commission. He has many, many accolades, including Queensland Australian of the Year for 2021. So you must have got that uh, two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Yeah, yes. so congratulations. Wow. Um, and also in 2022, he published his autobiography, Stronger, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, Dinesh. Thank you for joining me on season five, episode one of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Uh, thanks for having me. I've been excited. Thank you. And you are an absolute, anti uh, not antithesis, you are a perfect example of somebody not just surviving and thriving. I know your story, but for the audience, tell me a bit more about your background and your personal story. Uh, yeah, in a nutshell, um, I was born in Sri Lanka uh, and we uh, were in Sri Lanka when the war was happening there. Mm. So uh, the, it, was, it was a pretty, pretty violent war and it lasted over 30 years. Um, yeah. And then we moved to Australia when I was 10 years old. Uh, we lived in Sydney for a little bit, then we lived in Byron Bay, which is just beautiful. It's a beautiful place to grow up, or not grow up. <laughs> and uh, we moved to Brisbane after that, and then uh, uh, I went to, I studied law when we lived in Brisbane, and when I was in law school, I experienced depression and anxiety. Uh, panic disorder and things, things got pretty bad actually. Uh, and then um, we ended up, um, I, I ended up deciding to study medicine after that because, you know, my doctor inspired me uh, at the time. And then uh, I went into medical school after law, moved to Gold Coast, uh, and, and it, life was awesome, life was amazing. But, um, I had a car accident halfway through medical school and mm. had a spinal cord injury and lost the use of my fingers and everything below the chest. I spent about seven or eight months in hospital, uh, got discharged, and then four years later came back to medical school, um, which was um, a long journey. Mm. And, and, um, graduated from medical school and uh, here we are, seven years later, I work in the emergency department at the Gold Coast University Hospital and it's awesome. Absolutely. And I, as I say, I keep referencing your book, but I hear your whole story, the, your, your playful life when you were younger and about the car accident and then about your journey as well as you, you came to terms with your disability and then moving through medis medical school and everything. Um, now I l listed all the different things. I mean, for a man your age, let alone um, a man that's been through what you've been through, you've achieved a tremendous amount. 
But what would you say you are most proud of um, in either your career or just your personal life so far? Uh, graduating from medical school was, you know, it's the, it's the number one um, because I think it uh, embodies so many things. Like it embodies the spinal cord injury, you know, coming back from that. It, um, it has to do with my mom, like it was just me and my mom um, after the spinal cord injury and we struggled so much to, you know, we were even talking about like when I, when I first came back to medical school, um, we, didn't, we didn't have a car for the longest time, so it was only 10 years after that accident we bought a car. So my mom used to take me to the tram uh, every morning and uh, it was, I was shivering and we used to get to the hospital and then I'd get around the hospital. And so even little little things like that and then um, there was so many uh, doubts and there were so many people um, that felt that it was not possible. So there, there were so many things around that uh, that you know built up to that moment. So I think graduating from medical school just meant so many different things. To me. Yeah, and your mother is obviously a real beacon of light in your whole life. She's clearly fabulous. But being able to go through all that and not even having a car. To, to get to medical school. I mean, medical school is a big enough achievement without all the other um, issues going through that. So fabulous, congratulations. Um, but challenges, we all like to hear about people's challenges. What would you say was your, were your main ones and how did you overcome them? I think it's actually the spinal cord injury that itself was uh, so I'm gonna say, before I had the injury, I had no idea what life was like for a person with a spinal cord. I never thought about it, right? I used to see someone using a wheelchair and I thought, okay, that, you know, that mm. must be tough, but uh, I never actually understood the depth of what that meant. I never understood, oh, wow, like, you know, when there's uneven surfaces on their stairs, how do you get it out? How do you get in and out of the wheelchair into a car or, or a bed or something? Um, what if you lose the use of your fingers? How do you hold things and how do you do things? So there were all these surface things that I still didn't understand. And there were deeper things like, you know, I can't control my body temperature anymore. And um, so when, when it comes to winter and when it comes to other things, like it gets really hot and cold. Um, the blood pressure drops. Uh, I was just telling someone earlier, actually, you know, when I eat something, my blood pressure can really drop. So it, when I'm at work and I really eat much, and I just make sure to eat the right things. So there are all these physical things and there are all these social things around it, like um, money and family and friends and relationships, mm -hmm. and even healthcare and education. So there's so much around it. Mm -hmm. So I think um, figuring out life with the spinal cord injury is probably the, the biggest challenge was. Absolutely. And I don't know, I first met you, so to speak, at the Something Tech event. And I don't know whether you remember the question I asked, but I also have experienced disability. So I felt an immediate affinity with you because I've experienced it myself. Uh, that was in 2005 and by some kind of miracle I regained my mobility um, but did experience it um, being paralysed from the neck down for about six months and as you say you don't you don't realise what other people go through until you've experienced it yourself um, and I just had a glimpse um, but yeah and but also your positive attitude, because life is what you make it as well. Um, and, and you're helping all those people. So that's fantastic. But getting back to the spinal cord injury, and this isn't, this isn't a podcast about me, this is about you. You are obviously the hero of the show. But um, you 
I have with a few other people uh, been doing a research project with Biospine um, and it's about helping people with spinal cord injuries um, and I think it's VR is it that you're using but tell me a bit more about the tech and how um, in, a, in more simple terms how it works and, and what have you yeah so um Ever since I had the accident, I've been looking at what kind of science has been happening, what, what's exciting, what's what's working, what's not. And one of the couple of the things, I suppose, that emerged over the last 10 years, uh, or probably, yeah, probably about 10 years, one is um, electrical stimulation and drug therapy of the spinal cord. And these two things were shown in animal studies and clinical studies uh, to restore some function in people with paralysis. And the other one is thought controlled rehabilitation using virtual reality and exoskeleton and things like that. Um, so yeah. our project has put both of those things together. So we use thought controlled virtual reality driven uh, electrical stimulation and we have used uh, drug therapy as well. And um, the idea is to, yeah, restore function with people with spinal cord injury and we think uh, or the hypothesis for some of these things is that if you sort of prime the spinal cord with the drugs and, and stimulate it that way, and then give stimulation with electric uh, stimulation from the bottom up towards the brain, and then the brain down where you get people to think about it, uh, it, it seems to have an effect on the spinal cord where neurons can grow and rewire itself. So that's what we're doing, and we're pretty excited about it. It's absolutely incredible, but again, it's the power of the mind, um, as well as the physiology as well, but it's absolutely incredible. Um, and within the last 10 years that, that this, is, this has happened. Um, my other question as well is about automation and robotics, which is everywhere in our lives and will increase. So what impact do you think it will have on medicine and what parts of medicine as well can't be replaced by automation and robotics? This is such a timely question because I had a discussion about this with a colleague yesterday. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah. um, I, uh, I read a book a little while ago. It's called The Creative Destruction of Medicine by Dr. Eric Topol. And he's a cardiologist that will call you in But the whole book is on this topic. And what he's saying is that medicine is so slow to adapt, or has been historically. Mm -hmm. And the way we've done things, like we, that we kind of stick to these old ideas and old ways of doing things, purely because of tradition, purely because of, um, I don't know, you know, it's, 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 it's just one of those professions, right? And what he's saying is that we need to. We just need to change and adapt because the technology is so much better than this. You know, Nicola, I'm, I'm still blown away that we fax things sometimes. Why do we fax things? <laughs> um, so, uh, the, there's a lot that we can use to change things. There's a lot that we can use to make things more efficient. And that can be things like um, you can use uh, voice recognition in, in the emergency. I use it at work every day and it, and it makes things quicker, right? It makes things quicker to write your notes and make things quicker. The electronic medical record has been an incredible thing because a patient comes in and you can suddenly see everything, right? You don't need to bring up their records and their files and flip through their files. It's all ordered and you can see what's been going on. And that can actually save a life. Mm -hmm. So all those basic things are there, but then if you think about um, robotic assisted surgery, um, you can use some robots to provide care to remote areas, to rural areas. Um, you can make medicine more precise um, yeah. with some of these technologies. So there is heaps that will make medicine better, that will that will provide better patient care, that will make it more efficient, particularly at a time that we're struggling with costs and things. So Eric Topol again says that um, technology. Um, is actually a tool that can be used to uh, give back 
the most important thing in medicine, which is the time on end tradition of the doctor patient relationship. Mm -hmm. So, all this stuff can free us up to give us back that doctor patient relationship, which is what we need. Absolutely. So, bringing in efficiencies to make it more streamlined. So, like, I mean, it would have been the same. I remember back in the UK when I had mine. Um, illness back in 2005 they'd have to bring in a whole trolley full of notes it was ridiculous and then when it reared its ugly head again in Australia back in 2018 going through the NHS was just you well, forget it you'd have to tell your story all again so if you could have that communication um, but it is all about people that people-centric approach is yeah. is as you say, it's not just what you know as a medic, it's the way that you make people feel. Um, and again, that mind over matter as well. That's, um, right. that, that's why this is such a sacred thing because there's a human community. And, mm. and like all of our systems and things need to be structured to, to protect that. Uh, but sometimes I think we get, we get distracted. Exactly, and bringing kindness into the uh, into the equation. Um, yeah. uh, in your book, you talk about. I think you like to always be fresh and clean and have a shower twice a day. Um, and I remember, I love to wash my hair every day. I hate having dirty hair, and I couldn't wash my hair, and I was in tears about it. And this nurse had a that was looking after me. She had a hairdressing appointment on a Saturday morning, it was a day off, but she came in before the appointment to do my hair. And that just made the world of difference to me. But again, it's just that kindness. But she, if you've got all that automation, the robotics and everything in place. Um, and you say in your book, which I've referred to several times, um, your disability set you free. What do you mean by that? Why do you think your disability set you free? Uh, there is this beautiful um, haiku, an old, old Japanese one, um, and it says that something along the lines of my barn having burnt down, I can see the moon. Uh, the actual words are a bit different, but um, I think sometimes we hold on to so many things, right? We mm -hmm. hold on to so many things, and I think as human beings, we're, we're accumulators of things. Um, but often we have to lose it all, and I think I lost it all when I had depression. Um, in not a, not not to the same extent as, as the spinal cord injury, um, but when I had the spinal cord injury, like I lost it all, like I lost family, friends, everything, like all the belongings. But I think that that's what I that's that's how I became free because then I could really get back to me. I could reinvent myself. I could become who I am, and I think having all that stripped away allowed me to become who I am today uh, and, and to be better hopefully you know like now these days I just want to be better every day I want to be, I want to be better because there's been so many milestones in my life as well but they remind me to be a better human being for the people around me out in the community so um, I had but I had to lose everything to, to do that and yeah. so uh, and even when we talk about spinal cord through research, people are like, the reason I'm able to contribute to that is because I have spinal cord injuries. Absolutely. So you've got the perfect understanding of what people go through and what people actually need and what they don't need as well, which is equally as important. Um, obviously, our stories are, are different, but there are similarities, and I think. I experienced a similar thing that people will say to you, God, you're unlucky. And you're like, no, no, I'm alive. And 
I mean, at the, at the particular time. And it gives you the opportunity to reassess your life and, and what have you. Yes. Now, you are a total go-getter. Wheelchair or not, you're around all over the place. Everybody knows you, Dinesh. Even my mother-in-law, who's staying with us at the moment, she knew who you were. She's from the UK. Um, so, what would you say are your secrets to your success and all that you achieve, which is more than pretty much everybody? So, how do you do it? What are your secrets? Um, there are probably a number of things. Um, so, one is uh, gratitude. You know, I'm almost so grateful. I grew up in Sri Lanka among the poorest people on this planet. I grew up in a war. Now I'm in Australia, now we have, um, yeah, Nicola, like we both come from other parts of this world, right? I mean, so I get, to, we get to, I get to live here and enjoy the sun and the beauty of this place and the people. And uh, it's taken me in, so I'm grateful for that. And I feel like I'm making the most of it. At least yeah. with this, you know, to respect the other people in this world who don't have uh, the opportunities that I have. So that's one, and I'm grateful for, grateful for everything. Um, to more like, uh, um, I, I think, um, life is an opportunity to just become better every day and to, uh, just to, to learn more and do more and to understand things. Like, I, every night I, um, or at least most nights, I try to uh, read a few pages of something about medicine to make myself better and read a few pages of something to make myself better as a human being. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, so that's one, and I think the third one is kind of related to that, it's just about having humility, right? Like, it's, um, I think it's really important to stay grounded and to understand that we are so, so in, entwined in each other, uh, and there's a um, saying in uh, Zulu, I think it is, Ubuntu, which is I am because of you, and it's remembering that we are because of each other, and, and, and remembering that we have to be humble and grounded, because, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here talking because of you, and you invited me to do that, and, you know, like, we're, we're, we're just, our lives are entwined like that, so, I think uh, in that sense, please stay humble and then remember that human beings are the most important thing. And, uh, so yeah, uh, there are a few things like that, and and I think challenges, um, embracing challenge and embracing hardship. There's an amazing book by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle Is the Way, and um, he has a series of books. But uh, in the obstacle is the way he's saying that actually the challenges are the way that you become better and the way you grow. And uh, he's, he has a few other things like you're going to be courageous and you're going to be bold. And you've got, you know, so, um, yeah. I think this world, like, we, it's been built by dreamers. It's been built by people who see the big picture. It's been built by we have so many things because of people like Nicola Tesla and Thomas Edison and Albert mm -hmm. Einstein and um, people who fought for freedom and people who fought to build this world but they were brave, they were bold, they created all these things, right? And so um, we have a responsibility to carry on that legacy as we want to do with a better future for humanity and, and to make sure that we leave this a better place for our children and people. Uh, dream up. Absolutely. And that is what this podcast series is all about, is having a positive impact on people and planet and how technology can do that. But it has to start with people. And I love your secrets because they're not huge. I mean, sorry, that wasn't phrased correctly, but they, everyone can have gratitude. Everyone um, can be constantly learning and have humility as well um, and also look for the challenges in life obviously you've had one of the biggest ones there but you've certainly overcome that um, 
And Ryan Holiday, Stillness is the key I've listened to as opposed to read. read. Read, sorry, I can't speak today. Uh, but I like listening to them on um, Audible, which is quite good when you wake up in the morning rather than scrolling social media, which puts you in a bad mood. If you listen to somebody who's a bit more inspiring, it's, it's uh, much more empowering and what have you. So, Dinesh, my last question. Yeah. If you could go back in time before the car accident, what would you say to your youngest, the younger self, knowing what you know now or experience of what you've experienced now? No, I, w I probably wouldn't change anything. Like, you know, I, I like, mm -hmm. uh, um, but I would say, good Lord, you're handsome. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> no. You're a man after all, Dinesh. <laughs> Uh, I'd, um, I'd probably say, you know, just, just keep going. I think that that would be it. Like, just keep going and that everything will be okay. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I could, because I, I wouldn't want to change anything, you know, because it's led to this point and who I am. So I think all those, all those things have taught me something and all the hardships have taught me something. Say, to keep going, but I think um, also to seize the day is really important. Um, yeah, I, I, but I don't think I'd say anything that would change the trajectory of what was to come. Absolutely. So, carp diem. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights, Dinesh. It's I feel like I know you because I've listened to you at Something Tech, read the book, um, listened to your TED Talks, but it's marvellous to actually meet the real person. So thank you very much. And is there anything else that you'd like to share at all? Uh, thanks so much, Nicola, for having me today. It's been such a cool chat. Um, and I've also enjoyed checking out your bookshelf and photos. <laughs> Do you want me to talk you through them? Yeah, I wouldn't mind actually. So my, uh, they seem a bit random. So my business is called JJP Talent Solutions, which is Jessica, the black and white photo. Uh, she's about three there and she's now 17. She is the child. I had her in May and by July when I fell into my coma and woke up totally paralyzed. Um, the other J is Jasmine, who's about five there with a dolphin down in your part of the world at, the, at SeaWorld on the Gold Coast. Um, she's 12 now. And then the little black and white dog there, she's about 10 weeks. Uh, she's now five and she's called Purdy, so JJP, um, because they are the most important things to me. Um, but yes, so those are my kind of random things there and then I've got a variety of books and what have you. I love it. But as you say, always be learning um, and be kind. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I really do think uh, today, more than ever in this world, kindness is one of the most important things. Kindness, consideration for each other and humanity. Mm -hmm. And Looking at what we can give to our neighbour and our world is the most most important thing. If we can just do those things, and I think we would thrive. Absolutely. Give more and take less. Uh, and the world would be a better place. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been fabulous to talk to you. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review. The Don't Just Survive Thrive podcast is part of the Spotlight series, which includes the YouTube channel Spotlight on Software Development. If you want more insights into the software industry, particularly purpose-led tech startups and scale-ups, then subscribe to this channel. Thank you for listening. 
until next time. Thank you.